you don't have connectivity, it causes frustration. And let me just say, in the church world, that's a good thing. I believe that if you're not connected to the body, if you're not connected in church, if you're not connected with believers, you should be frustrated. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit will frustrate you. Because connection, fellowship, as the Bible calls it, is so, so important. Do you know, in 2005, there was a guy named Gregory Burns who did uh, conducted experiments to gauge how people responded to uh, social pressures, peer pressure. And so what he did was he got a whole lot of people together and he split them up into groups of five. Then what he did was he asked very, very basic questions. But he had put specific people in the groups to answer the questions incorrectly. But they had to be vocal. They had to be expressive. They had to uh, really just dominate the conversation because he wanted to see, even if you ask the basic of questions, would social pressure get to you? And you know what? Between 40 and 50% of the people that obviously knew the right answer, after hearing the wrong answer and people being persuasive around them, actually went with the crowd. Isn't it amazing? I'm talking about basic questions like one plus one. And then someone jumps up and says, three. Yes, it's three. Come on, guys, it's three. And everyone jumps up three. And you can see the absolute confusion on this person's face. Three. Three. Okay, yes, three, three. It's, it's amazing. So what that proves is simply this. People influence people. I'm sorry, I know that's deep theology right there, but here's the fact. People influence people. My question is that during this lockdown and COVID experience, what, or should I say, who has been influencing the children of God? We need to carefully look at what has been influencing us. I tell you what has been influencing many Christians all over the world is a spirit of fear. We have seen so many Christians being bound up by fear. Now, I'm not talking about let's all be stupid, take our masks off and and just go crazy. Well, I'm not talking about that. What I am saying is that when we are bound by fear, it's not of God. We've been influenced by wrong things. It's time, and, and it's so important that the church, once again, gets back to a place where we are connected, first of all, with God, and secondly, connected with each other, because we need each other. I don't know about you, but I need people to inspire me. I need people to encourage me. I need people to edify me. I need people to instruct me. I need people around me that will draw me closer and closer into God's will for my life, because the world is not going to do that. There are certain friends that are definitely not going to do that, but we need God and His children, His church around us. People influence people. So here's the thing. I want to focus on a little scripture, and before I do that, I want to pray and ask God to speak to us today in a supernatural way. Are you ready for that? All right, let's pray together. Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Once again, I always pray this because I honestly believe this. Anything that's of the flesh, Lord, may it die. But anything that's of the Spirit, anything that's birthed of you, Lord, may it bring life May it draw us closer to you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that today you would teach us, you would instruct us, and you would draw us closer to our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Here's a scripture we've all heard many, many times. Us preachers, we love preaching the scripture because it's one of those scriptures that make everyone cringe, okay? And it says this, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together. Have you heard that scripture before? Ever, ever, anyone heard that? Yeah, we've heard that. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? So I want to focus for, for a moment on the first part of that scripture that says, do not be unequally yoked together. Now, we all believe that to be true. I don't think there's any Christian here that'll be like, yeah, yeah, that's not true. I disagree with it. No, we all agree with it. But can I make a statement today? If that statement, do not be unequally yoked together, is true, then the opposite of that must also be true. The opposite of that must also contain truth and contain power for us. So if I had to take that statement and give you the total opposite, it might read like this. Do be equally yoked together with believers. Be equally yoked together, believers. Because you see, if I say God is good, everyone shouts amen. If I say the devil is bad, everyone's like, yes, amen. This is the opposite of what Paul was saying. 
unequally yoked together with unbelievers is bad for you, but here's the thing. If you're yoked together with believers, it has to be good for you. We need each other. Last week, we spoke about the fact that, number one, we were created for connection. We were actually created to connect. We were created for fellowship. How do I know that? Right in the beginning, in the book of of Genesis, we read that God creates man. He puts him in the most perfect environment. Everything is amazing. He's living in Eden. He's living in paradise. In fact, he has God with him every single day of his life. I mean, there's nothing that can be added. There's nothing that can be taken away. He's just just totally engulfed in God's presence. I mean, it's heaven on earth. Yet God looks at him and says, this is not good. In fact, his words were, it's not good for man to be alone. See, you and I were not created for isolation. You and I were not created to be set apart all by ourselves, all on our little island. No, we've been created for community, for fellowship, connectivity. Connection, secondly, balances and increases our power. We understand that. Why? Because the scripture which we use in every wedding that you go to is two is better than what? One. Two is better than one. Why? There's strength in community. And thirdly, connected, being connected, we are connected because we are part of the body of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, and he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head, the head over all things to the church. Why? Which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are the body of Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 45, for even as we have many members as in one body and all members do not have the same function. We are one body. We are actually created to be together. Isn't it amazing that God puts us together? He has five facts about the church, which we all need to know. Five facts about the church. First of all, it has many parts. There's unity in diversity. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. It's a good thing that we don't all look the same. It's a good thing that we don't dress the same. It's a good thing that we don't uh, sound the same. It's important that there are differences in the church. And later on, I'm going to explain why. It's important because there's unity in diversity. We need to remember that in a body, you have a head. The head is what controls the body. If, for example, and unfortunately there are some people that are affected in a negative way with disease or some form of of malfunction in the body. If, for example, your hands decide to do their own thing, it can look a little bit strange. Because imagine if I'm preaching, I'm like, you know, God is going, and next moment I'm like, you know, and I start pulling Michael Jackson moves. I won't do it here in public. While I'm preaching and I start doing this, everyone's going to be like, what is wrong with this oak? You see, because if the, if the body, if the hands and feet decide not to be controlled, not to be led by the mind, by the head, there's going to be problems. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is head of the body. Jesus Christ is the, it, it, we are his bride. And, uh, and we need to understand something that when you are part of the church, you are part of his body. I, I don't know about you, but how insulting would it be if you come into an a environment and you got your wife with you and you walk in, hey, everyone, everyone's like, ah, Pastor Ryan, yeah, it's so good to see you. Who's there with you? Who's there? You're like, this is my wife. And they're like, no, we don't want to hear. You, you're amazing. We, you, we love you. You can, you can come and have a good, but no, to get her out, get her out. I don't want anything to do with her. How, how do you think that would make me feel? Do you think I will be like, no, this is cool. The wife, get to the car. I like this place. No, you don't do that. Because if you insult the wife, you insult the husband. For many people, they seem to think it's okay to insult Jesus' bride and think it does not affect him. Of course it affects him. Of course it does. Second fact, everyone is needed to make the body complete. Every part of the body is important. If you see it here today, if you're online, you've got to know something. that Every part of the body is vital. Did you know that some of the most important parts of the body are the ones that are unseen? I mean, my heart is keeping me going today. If that thing is not beating, guess what? To be absent of the body is to be present of the Lord. I just die. 
We need some of those parts of the body that you might not see. You might be the person that's evangelizing every single day at the workplace, preaching the gospel. Let me tell you, you are vital in the kingdom of God. You might be a, a person that might not be in the limelight, might not be in the front yet, jumping up and down, but you're sitting at every single service and you're praying for your pastor. You're praying for the success of God's kingdom. Let me just say, you are vital in the kingdom of God. Every single person is vital. Every part of the body is vital for the progression of the kingdom of God. Thirdly, we have to work together. We actually have to work together, ladies and gentlemen. You can't have the feet fighting the, the hands. You know how crazy that would look? When, when you're trying to talk to someone, next moment you're thrown in your back and your feet are kicking your face. How, how we would look at that and say, no man, there's a problem here. What's wrong with you? We probably want to cast out demons. But here's the thing. That's what the church of Jesus Christ does quite often. We fight each other. The hand doesn't like the hand. And you gotta, no, let me tell you, we need unity in this day and age. Four, we belong to each other. And five, we need each other's in terms of the part. We're all part of the body of Christ. Listen to this quote. I love this. Robert, uh, Robert Lenka said these words. I don't think there's any question in Scripture that God expects us to come together in a community to worship him and to support each other. The thrust of the New Testament from Acts onward is about followers of Christ risking their lives and freedom to make believers and to establish churches. Nowhere does Paul or Silas or Peter or any of the apostles go into a city to make believers and then send them home and expect them to pray all by themselves and call that following Jesus Christ. You don't ever find that. You never find people coming and preaching the gospel, getting them saved, and then telling them, listen, go home. Go all by yourself. You don't find that happening. D.L. Moody said, church attendance is vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood is to a sick man. We need to gather. We need to be connected. John Calvin said, wherever we see the word of God purely preached and heard, there, is a ch there the church of God exists, even if it swarms with many faults. Now, you might be asking the question, why are you quoting different people? The reason why I'm quoting all these people is simply this. Not only does the Bible speak about gathering together, but every preacher, every man of God that is spirit-filled, every person that maybe you read his books or whatever it is, I want you to know something. Every single person will always speak for the gathering of the church. Billy Graham, anyone know Billy Graham? Can you imagine Billy Graham standing in front of thousands of people? Just try and imagine. Use your imagination for him. Billy Graham standing in thousands of people. Gives the most amazing altar call. People come running forward. They cry, giving their hearts to Jesus. Billy Graham prays over them and he leads them to Christ. And then he says these words, guys, thank you for giving your hearts to Jesus. Now what I want you to do is just go home. Don't find a church. Please don't submit to a pastor. Just go and do your own thing because Jesus loves you. Can you? imagine him saying that yet can i say something there are so many believers out there that actually believe that it's fine not to be part of a fellowship it's fine now i know i'm talking to i'm talking to the wrong people this morning i really am i'm talking to the wrong people but what i'm going to ask you to do is help me i'm going to ask you to support me because here's the thing we have so many people today who don't see the value of community there are so many Christians out there that don't see the value of being together. There's so many Christians out there who don't see the value of actually being part of a family. And I'm needing you to help me because everyone's expecting me to say it from here. But it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to share this message with their neighbors, their friends, their loved ones, people that might have fallen off the way, people who might have been hurt in church before, people who have been disillusioned by a pastor before. Let me just say, we are not part of a body because there's perfect people here we're part of the body because it's the body of jesus christ and he's called us to be together colossians 2 18 to 19 i'm almost finished here's this let no one defraud you i love that word defraud on the scripture because here's the thing if you've ever experienced fraud initially it doesn't look bad 
Initially, it doesn't feel bad. Initially, there, there, there's, there's an expectation that you think might be fulfilled. It's like, I don't, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but when I was, uh, uh, I think I was in matric, grade 12, and we were in a beach run together, and uh, my mom and dad uh, gave me some money, and we were going to spend the day at the beach, I was going to buy lunch, and then there was this guy, no joke, seriously, this guy had three little boxes, and he had like a little marble in the box, and he was, go he was doing this, I don't know if you can see on the table, he was doing a shh, 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 shh. do you know one of those oaks, hey, shh, 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 shh. and he's like, choose one, choose one, so I'm like, oh, that one simple oh he says you're right that's amazing well done you're brilliant at this i'm like oh yeah i am i'm awesome he said well listen listen i tell you what you put five rand down i put 20 rand down okay you choose the right one 20 bucks is yours i'm thinking this is so easy anyone can do this man so guess what he goes i win i won i was so excited yes i'm the champion at this game this is amazing he says how much money you got i said i got like i got now i got your 20 my five plus another 45 rand i also put 45 rand i put 200 rand down you'll get this easy i'm like yes let's do it i'm like i'm positive i know it's there i know it's there i got that one i'm thinking yeah 200 bucks take it i lost everything but it looked so good i was defrauded let's carry on with the scripture delighting humility and the worship of angels and true intruding into things which you have not seen without a cause being vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from whom all the body having been supplied through the joints and bands, having been joined together, will grow with the growth of God. What happens when you disconnect it from the body? The best way for me to describe what that looks like is to show you what it looks like to be connected to the body. You see, the same scripture we read, the New Living Translation puts it this way and says, and they were not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he who holds the whole body together and with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. There are so many people being defrauded. Like I was, I was totally suckered in. I thought this is going to be amazing. I'm going to win a lot of money. Do you know a lot of people ha have come up with this conclusion? It is so amazing not to go to church. Because it starts off wonderful. It starts off like this. Come on, those watching online, maybe this speaks to you. But I know it doesn't speak to you because you are here. But there are people that actually think like this. Think about this. You wake up five to nine for a nine o'clock service. Doesn't that feel great? You're still in your pajamas. You haven't even brushed your teeth yet. And you can go to church. I mean, that's amazing. That's awesome. You sit here with your cup of coffee, and then the five-minute countdown goes. You're like, oh, those poor suckers sitting at church. I'm at home. I'm having an awesome time. I'm getting God's Word. It's amazing. But you know what happens over time? Instead of waking up five to nine, you wake up five past nine. And then now you're like, oh, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Five minutes later, I'm not going to miss out much. Make the cup of coffee. You sit down about 20 past nine. The praise and worship is finished. You think, oh, it's okay. I've just missed the praise and worship. Sorry, Andy. Just missed the praise and worship. It's okay. I can rewind later. At least I've got time for the word. I'll just, I'll just sit and watch the word a little bit and get nourished. Amazing. But what happens is then one Sunday you wake up, you don't feel like it. And in the back of your mind, you think, you know what? I can watch this Monday. Because it's online, I can just catch up later. And guess what? After a while, you've missed two, three, four, five, six services, and you have been defrauded. You have lost. It happens. You see, when you are connected, you grow. That's where you grow. I want to talk about, I want to end off with this. We have to grow. Did you know you have to grow? I'm sorry to tell you this. I know, I know, I'm, I, tomorrow's my birthday. I, I, don't, I don't always enjoy getting into higher numbers. But you know it's natural to grow. It's unnatural to, to, to not grow. And Christians, for some reason, think it's fine to stay in nappies till you're 120. 
Here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to grow. I, 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 I'm going to make a statement, and I want you to hear this. It's time for the church of Jesus Christ to mature. I want to say that again. We actually have to mature. Now, I'm going to make a statement that not everyone's going to agree with. I get it. I'm willing to debate. I'm open to it. But here's the thing. I want to make the statement. I believe it is in church gatherings where we are led to maturity, and I want to show you why. I want you to hear me. I believe it's in church gatherings. That is where we actually grow. I need you all, those on Facebook and those here today, I need you to help me share this message. Because it's important for people to, I'm not saying let's scrap the law, let's just get back. No, no, no. There's laws. There's protection. I'm not saying be stupid. What I am saying is we need to have a desire to get back because that's where we grow. Listen to this. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. And truly, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and this until we come into unity of faith and the full knowledge of the Son of God to what? A fully grown, mature man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. I know what some of you are thinking. But Ryan, I can, I can write a letter to a prophet and he can prophesy over my life through an email. I can read a good book and get some good teaching. I can watch online and, and hear a good evangelical message. I can subscribe to an apostle and have his covering over me via the internet. I can, I, can, I can go on to online counseling if I need some pastoral work. So what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean gathering is going to help me? What do you mean gathering the, or being part of a church is going to help me? Come on. You, you, what are you talking about? La, la, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Good points. But if you want to be a professional rugby player, cricket player, even an individual sport like tennis or squash, you want to be professional. You want to be regarded as someone that is so good at the sport. Did you know you have to belong first before you can prove yourself? Now you might say, what do you mean belong? What do you mean belong? What do you talk about belong? Well, first of all, you need a coach. You need someone to impart into your life. And then secondly, you have to be tested. I can stand in front of you. I can come with my squash racket and go, hey, everybody, my squash racket here. You know that I'm the champion. Yes, I am the champ. I am, hey, get in. I, I'm the champion and I, I can beat everyone in squash. I can, listen, I can talk a good game, but until I'm actually put into the test, it means absolutely nothing what you're saying. I want you to know something. You've got to belong to a club. You've got to have coaching. You've got to have people. You've got to test yourself with people before you know how good you are. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you know you are maturing as a Christian if you only hang around people that never challenge you? Now, come on. Let's just be quite honest. I, I, there are so many. I've, I've run into so many Christians in the valley, beautiful people, loving Jesus, loving God, thinking that they're maturing their faith, but never are challenged in their faith. Now, I'm not talking about the challenge that comes from the non-believers in your workplace, because you expect them to be hard. You expect them to be ugly to you at times. You expect them to let you down. But when you're in a family, that's when you get tested. That's when you get tested. This morning, I used uh, uh, Debbie. Debbie as an example. You see, this is how Debbie knows she's maturing. She walks into church. She goes to her favorite corner, her chair, because every ch Christian's got their chair. When she arrives at her chair, there's someone else sitting there. Can I just say, what a great test of maturity right there. And Debbie didn't mind me picking on her, so it's fine. So Debbie rocks up. There's someone sitting in a chair. Debbie immediately is having a test of faith. How she responds to someone sitting in her chair. She, can, she could be tested and found to be maturing because initially if someone is sitting in Debbie's chair, Debbie's like, sorry, that's my chair. Sorry, don't you know? I don't care if it's your first time. This is my chair. Get up and go sit somewhere else. But now Debbie comes and sees someone sitting in a chair and says, look, I normally sit there, but I want you to know it's a blessed chair. Whoever sits there receives from the Lord and I want that for you today. May you be blessed of God. Come on. 
Ladies and gentlemen, can I say something today? Being part of a church matures you. It matures you. Many people claim to be Christians, but there's a difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. There are so many people in the word, world that are fans. They, they love Jesus. They think he's amazing. I run into them at Peak Coffee Shop. I run into them Stag. I run into them in the malls. There's so many Christians out there that absolutely they are a fan of Jesus. They're always speaking about Jesus is amazing. Jesus is the, And it's great. I mean, it's wonderful to be a fan. But there's a big difference between being a fan and a follower. Are you a follower of Christ or are you just a fan? I can't imagine Jesus speaking one-to-one -one with person saying, you know what, I, know, I, 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 I thank you for accepting me. Thank you for making me your Lord and Savior. You know what, I don't want you to be part of the church. I, I don't want you to be part of fellowship. I want you to be all by yourself for the rest of your life because that's my plan for you. I can't imagine Jesus telling a follower, follow me. Jesus was always either alone with the Father praying or with people. Prayer is fine to be alone. But ministry, you've got to have people. And I want to encourage you as you're in this building today. I need you to help me. I need you to help me to, to draw in those that perhaps have been drawn away. Perhaps they've been hurt by previous past experiences in church. Maybe their expectations was on people instead of the expectations being put on God. It's time for us to get people back into fellowship. I want to end off with where I'm going to start the next time I preach. You want to know where we're going to start? I'm going to end off where we're going to start. Mark 8.34 says this. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me the first sign of maturity is when you have the ability to deny yourself deny my needs deny my wants deny my pleasures and follow Jesus that's where we're going to start next time I speak. And that's how we end today. I want to ask you the question. Are you a fan of Jesus? Or are you a follower? Which one are you? Every head bow, every eye closed. Come on, just think about it for a moment. It's good to love Jesus. It's good to be excited every time we talk about him. But sometimes following him means that you need to actually deny what you want and ask, what do you want, Jesus, from me? And so, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, to every one of us, including myself. And Lord, I, we all love you. In this room, I just sense, I hear, I feel that we'll we love you. We have a passion for you. Those online, we love, we're passionate about you. But Lord, help us to be disciples. Help us to be followers of you in this day and age that we live in. So Lord, thank you for your grace, your mercy, your, just your loving kindness towards us. I pray for every one of us in this room that Lord, may we all be challenged and may we be the ones that challenge other people to come into the fellowship of the saints, the fellowship in the house of God. So we thank you and honor you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.